Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's webinar, um, the Blue Prism Automation Partner Showcase with Review Group. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go through a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, you would have joined the presentation listening using your, your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, please select phone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Uh, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by simply typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You will send in your questions anytime during the uh, presentation and we will collect this and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with the link to view the recording. So I'd like to now introduce our speakers today, right up Mark Fazakli, Head of Alliances for Blue Prism Australia New Zealand, and John Velastro, Partner for Review Group Asia Pacific. Over to um, you, Mark. Thanks, Mark, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those of you who we have, do have folks dialing in from uh, all around the world, according to our attendee list. Thank you all for taking the time out today to hear a little bit about one of Blue Prism's most successful partners. So, as per the introduction, we're pleased to have John Belastro, partner from uh, Reveal Group today. He looks after the APAC business. Um, Reveal Group, we'll hear a little bit more about before we, uh, in, during the session. But what we'd like to do before we kick off, we would like to understand what industries we have represented here. So we're going to have a three or four polls through this presentation. So the listeners are not going to just sit back and, and listen. It's a little bit interactive. We've got a few questions for you. Um, so our first poll, which uh, will be coming up shortly, is which industry groups are represented here today? So if you could just fill that in. And while you're doing that, um, John, Reveal recognised the value of RPA very early on in uh, the RPA life cycle. And this in turn is leading, you know, Reveal Group become one of our most successful partners. How have you seen or how do you see the Blue Prism Reveal relationship uh, delivering value to your clients? Thanks, Mark. And, um, and just let me just quickly say thanks again for setting this up and having us uh, involved. Really appreciate it. Look, um, at the starting point, it's um, this is our most enduring relationship in the RPA market. So it's got to be delivering some kind of value. And uh, to just give you a little bit of history, we were founded in Melbourne in 2005. Um, our whole business model is predicated on building and accelerating transformation programs for our clients, primarily by applying best in breed technologies. So uh, very important to us that our clients achieve operational excellence, primarily through automation. That's really what we're known for. And so the way we like to work with our clients, uh, very importantly, is that we help drive ongoing benefits through their own internal capabilities. So, our role we see in the relationship with our partners is to help build up their strengths, their knowledge, their know-how, and let them get on with the job of um, automating their own um, environments. Um, so our focus around enabling operational excellence really saw us uh, meet with Blue Prism uh, back in 2014. So as I said, our most enduring relationship. Uh, we saw Blue Prism as a leader in the market. Uh, and in particularly what we noticed was that it's focus on governance and particularly the ROM framework, as much as the quality of the technology was very aligned with the objectives that we have. So our objectives around creating sustainable scale for our clients. So from our perspective, while it's not hard to use RPA to uh, implement small tactical um, implementations, really when you start thinking about sustainable, scalable production operations, you, what you really need is a fit for purpose architecture, strong management, strong governance, and essentially we're very aligned with Blue Prism around that. And we're very pleased to, to hear that. And thank you all for the poll. No surprise to see uh, that we're high representation on financial services. And we'll come back to that poll a little bit later on uh, to have a bit of a chat about the various industries. So tell us a little bit about your capability in the I guess the broader automation space was started off as uh, RPA, a term coined by Blue Prism's then Chief Marketing Officer and now Chief Evangelist, um, just kind of now I guess morphed into intelligent automation as we see 
you know, things like AI and OCR and other capabilities, um, yeah. you know, natural language processing and so forth. So tell us about your capabilities that, that you have in that space. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great question, Mark. I mean, we essentially see ourselves as a digital transformation professional services firm uh, and system integrator. We really focus, as we've already highlighted, on RPA and the broader suite of intelligence uh, automation technologies. We've really been building out our capability in that set over over the last few years. Uh, what's important to us, though, is we and you know I think most most organisations like us actually like to build our services around a particular approach. Our approach, we call it the blueprint for scale. And what that really means is that we're looking at what's the right blueprint to manage the entire RPA program lifecycle. So we have services that range right from the beginning, which is demand management, opportunity assessment, all the way through delivery and the right having the right standards and practices around delivery. Uh, then we look at the, to your point, the technology integration side of things. So we're very strong around document digitization, data analytics, conversational AI. Um, we love to play with sentiment engines and chatbots, et cetera. So from that perspective, we bring everything to the table. Uh, more, most importantly, though, is we try to bring it together in a way that makes sense for our client. Um, you can really get lost in the noise in this space, and that's really something we try to avoid. Um, we're also strong in platform and technical infrastructure. It's a very important part of the picture that we think sometimes people miss in making sure that the underpinning foundations of their program is very solid as well. Uh, we've got a training academy, uh, which is obviously important when you're building client self-sufficiency, but we do also provide ongoing support and maintenance, and not surprisingly, we also do licensing as well. So as I said, we've got the complete package. Everything's covered. Um, more recent... Sorry, yeah. Sorry. yeah. We all know the story of the laptops in the cupboard, right? That's our Oh, talk story. about it. Yeah, no, we, we try to avoid the laptop in the cupboard these days if we can. Uh, the, uh, the Very importantly though, and, and I think this is one of the exciting developments for us, is that because of the depth of our experience, you know, we've got six plus years of experience in this space, we've actually started to develop tools that help to automate the process of automation. So we've been doing a lot of marketing over the last uh, couple of months around one of our new products uh, suites, which is the Robo Suite. Um, some people would have heard about it. We, we've actually developed a bunch of tools that help clients scale with confidence. Um, particularly, we have our robo designer tool and our robo review tool, which is really designed to help ensure that high quality automations are being generated. And uh, we've also got our robo manager product, which helps basically manage the entire portfolio of, a, of an RPA program. So these are, these are things that have literally come out of our experience in working this space. And we think they're very, very um, appropriate for the kind of market that we're, we're working in. So what does this all mean for us? Look, the, the approach that we've got, um, the tools that we now have, um, you know, that's helped us work with over 100 clients across 25 plus industries. Um, so we've got, we're, we're in everywhere from government, finance, telecommunications, resources, transport. We haven't yet found a market where we, or, or an industry where we can't deliver automation. And from a growth perspective, we've also doubled and tripled in size in the last few years as well. We're not just in APAC anymore. We're also based in New York, in North America more generally, Washington, DC, Toronto, and we have no intention of stopping there. Global domination. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't say it, you did. Yeah, look, I think I think it's interesting you bring up your tools because I know that's uh, one of the very few products that um, we as Blue Prison have actually taken on board as something that we will sell on your behalf. Uh, and I know that in North America, we're seeing pretty good uptake. And I guess, you know, I think we're starting to see that traction in the local market. So having, you know, Blue Prism staff have all clearly been enabled on that. So, you know, for those of you out there in listener land that are in, um, you know, in this development lifecycle, I urge you to have a look at those tools. And I guess it's a good segue into the next poll. So I'm sorry, folks, you're gonna have to look up from your email and things and uh, actually answer a question here. I mean. Where are you all in your you know, intelligent automation, RPA, AI journey? Tell us a little bit about it. We've only got a few choices there, it should take you a couple of seconds to do that. So John, while our listeners are doing that, one of the things that's of great note is that recently Reveal Group became the first organization in the world to achieve double platinum certification, which is platinum certification in both our delivery um, stream and our capability stream. So you put a lot of work into that. Tell us a little bit of how important that has been to uh, to Reveal Room. Oh, not surprisingly, it's extremely important, something we're really proud of. But um, I, to answer the question, I'll start with a slight negative, but I'm going to quickly move to the positive. So the, the negative aspect of why this is so important is 
and I'm sorry to say it in a way, but a sizable proportion of what we do in terms of our work and working with clients is remediating um, some, of their, um, some of their initiatives. And the reason why we see that and why we see it as often as we do is that people without the proper training, without the proper accreditation and understanding about what drives scale are trying to automate processes, which then leads to issues around, you know, a whole bunch of issues around things like maintainability, around security, around reusability of objects, around the stability of the platform and the processes, and also the manageability of it over time. So what we've, what we've seen or what we believe is that accreditation is probably the most effective and efficient shorthand method that we have to rapidly demonstrate quality to our clients and also to be, frankly, a really clear differentiator in the market as well. Uh, we, you know, the hurdles that we had to go through to actually get our double platinum, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's a testament to what you expect of us. Yes, we don't make it easy for you. <laughs> no, you do not make it easy. <laughs> but it's also a testament to the way, to the team as well and the quality of the team that we were able to meet all of those hurdles and actually uh, pass yeah. with fine yeah. colours. So from, from our experience, you know, clients actually seem to assume quality more often than they actually seek it out. And we, you know, we would suggest that you do your due diligence in terms of the quality of the, the resources that are working for you. Um, and, it's, and we think that actually getting the right skills is as important as selecting the right processes to automate. So from our perspective, being accredited to the highest standard possible with Blue Prism, uh, from us, it's a concrete demonstration of our commitment to quality and also the pride we take in serving our clients to the best of our ability. Yeah, no, look, and I think, you know, if we look at our, our poll um, results there, we have, you know, 10% of the folks haven't started RPA and are thinking about it. So that's great advice. I mean, you know, automation is fantastic, but if it's not done uh, right from the beginning, then there's nothing quite like an automated process going wrong to go wrong badly at scale and at speed. So, you know, great. I think, Blue Prism spent a, a huge amount of effort and time getting our certification program in place for exactly that reason. And what we're finding is as we urge our clients through their um, their life cycle, um, you know, for folks that have been on the journey over a year, we can see we've got 60% of their attendees have been on the journey over a year. Uh, and, and, you know, if we look at that, we've got another 17% that have only really just started. So 27% really just started. You know, for those folks, I, I urge you to look at that. What we always tell our clients, you know, please look for certified partners who have accredited resources. So yeah. for John's organisation to become um, platinum credit, they've, they've got a, more than 100 accredited developers, plus many other of the roles that we consider, um, you know, to be vital to the successful rollout of a, of a, you know, an automation platform and a transformational uh, journey. So well, as we can see from this, you know, RPA adoption is increasing significantly. I'm seeing a lot of interest, particularly in the in the challenging time that we're seeing at the moment. I mean, you know, what are you seeing at the moment in terms of accelerated interest? Is, it, is that something that's being, you know, imminent, you're seeing mirrored in the demand out there in the in the wide land? Probably not in Melbourne at the moment, unfortunately, where you are, uh, I guess, in terms of direct interaction. Yeah, just give us a little bit of commentary on that. Yeah, well, it's a, it is a little bit hard to be to follow the direct approach at the moment since we're in lockdown again. But, um, but look, absolutely, we're seeing um, a lot of acceleration. Look, we, we still see a lot of um, organisations on very different stages of their journey, but we're definitely seeing um, an increased interest. And I'm, and I'm quite happy to say that I think COVID's actually driven this a lot harder. Uh, mainly, we do see mainly our clients that have already begun the journey. They are now doubling down on their commitment. Um, the reason why I think they're doing that is that it's so they've already been exposed to the capability, they understand how the capability works, and they've also realised how the capability can support them and serve them through the challenges of COVID. Um, I, I mean, however, more generally now, and it's, and it's starting to happen more now, so I think as we started to get out of those initial first few months and more and more companies now starting to sort of rise up out of, out of that cloud, um, we're generally seeing that everyone's coming in with, you know, the, the financial impact of COVID being a key factor. So there's a much stronger focus on doing things that show a clear ROI. Um, there's a lot of conversations now about total cost of ownership and what does that mean and how do I how do I get a business case that stacks up? From my perspective yeah. or our perspective, we really welcome that. Um, it's a move away from what we saw before, which was 
let's just do a POC or let's just do a, let's do a proof of concept or let's do a proof of value. It's really about saying, how do we actually build a program that generates real value for the company and can have the biggest impact in the shortest possible time? Yeah. Um, perhaps even more importantly, we're seeing a bigger interest in RPA. And this is the next exciting step for me. We're seeing a lot more uh, use of RPA as a gateway tool to intelligent automation. And you know, when we talk about intelligent automation, we haven't really explained it much so far, but generally what we're talking about is how do you bring together a whole bunch of complementary technologies to create a more complete enterprise automation solution. Why are we doing that or why is that so important? You just get more bang for your buck in terms of not just looking at what RPA can cover, but you look at through the complementary technologies, you start to see end-to-end -end automation solutions, which is very exciting and creates a lot more opportunity. Look, I'll give you, and I'll give you an example. We've got a banking client we're working with at the moment. Uh, they are bringing together a whole bunch of different technologies to get a, to get a great result. So, document pro, so intelligent document processing, conversational AI, using RPA as a glue to bring it all together and to hold it tight. But you know, what is that leading to? Uh, mobile first, omni-channel, um, customer self-service. Um, it's a really important feature as part of the response to COVID. And from our perspective, it's about finding those best in breed tools that are available to create the solutions that are gonna simultaneously, and they're not just hitting the cost target, they're hitting the quality target, they're hitting the customer experience and target, and, and very importantly, they're also hitting the risk target as well. So they hit every target all at the same time. Interesting you say best of breed because that's, you know, Blue Prisms, and in my opinion anyway, one of our clear differentiators, how we've adopted this strategy of, you know, whatever you've got, we, we want to plug into. We want to become sort of the glue, the platform that sticks all those things together you know, via our, our, uh, our digital exchange where we have access to interact, including RoboSuite uh, on the digital exchange, where we have access to connect to the Abbeys, the Microsoft Cognitives, the Google the I.O., Watsons and, and so forth. I guess, um, you know, the current environment, John, is, is there's a lot of talk about, you know, and there has been for a long time, workplace 2.0 and now it's enterprise uh, 2.0. So, you know, a, a brief example, my wife works in, in banking and, and their, um, you know, business continuity plan was if Bangalore goes down, we switch to Chennai. If Chennai goes down, we switch to Delhi. If Delhi goes down, we switch to Manila. Of course, that all went up in a puff of smoke when, you know, they were all shut down. And as you would know, financial institutions in particular, and those of you on the, on the call, you, know, you can't exactly have somebody work from home with sensitive data, particularly in uh, less regulated economies. So how do you see um, automation sort of enabling the next generation of the enterprise? Well, and, and you, you, I mean, I'm glad you, you were referencing COVID so heavily because I think our conversation about the next generation of enterprise pre-COVID would have been a different conversation. It probably wouldn't have been quite as stark as it is now because, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that what's occurred has probably created the, the, the largest collective shift in social activity and working practices ever. Right? I mean, it's just been phenomenal what's happened in the last three months, three to four months, effectively. So, you know, so what, what's... Yet. And it's not over yet, exactly, yeah. I know. So. So the greatest realisation we're seeing amongst our clients, and it's also reflected a little bit in the thought leadership we're seeing coming out around COVID as well, is how technology and automation is being used to not just reduce health risks. I mean, that's obviously coming as part of a, one of the key messages from it, but also how do you protect productivity um, in yeah. a time of crisis? And um, I suppose uh, we're seeing a lot of conversations about you know, protecting productivity. But um, I think it's also notable from our perspective, again, that a lot of people aren't just talking about it, oh, I need to solve the problem just for today. They're not saying, I want to talk about you know, changes of practice for now. I want to talk about changes of practice that are going to last beyond COVID and that are actually all being driven through automation. So it's become a bit of a mantra with a lot of our clients, which, which we love, of course. Um, and also with some of the uh, new entrants that we're speaking to. And I think the exciting thing from our perspective is, is the way we work basically works with both new entrants and with more mature programs alike, uh, because we do focus very much on what are the best in breed solutions, what's the right governance framework. Um, and so from that perspective, I think the next generation of enterprise is really looking for how do I get that right balance in terms of picking the right tools and 
picking the right governance framework to protect my investment over time. Okay, that's great. I guess, you know, it's a, it's a good sort of lead into, you know, what are the roadblocks? So here again, you folks out there on the end of the uh, end of the wire, um, you know, it would be interesting to hear what roadblocks you're seeing to the adoption of RPA because, you know, there's, there's a, it, it's buzzword du jour, it's the data lakes of five years ago today, you know, how many of us have got the executives going, I need me some RPA and probably don't really know what they're talking about. So I'm interested to hear, you know, from you, what it is you think um, or you're perceiving to be as, as roadblocks there. So while our uh, listeners are doing that, John, I mean, can you share some examples of reveal enabling customers to drive actual competitive advantage? Because, you know, it, it's one thing to sort of do more with less, but how do we actually translate that into something that our executives are interested in, which is usually, you know, top line, revenue, bottom line, saving, that sort of thing. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so we, we are actually seeing people, uh, and it is, the, the conversation is moving much more freely from, and this is again from our perspective, uh, the conversation around automation and RPA, and, and also RPA is a great, as a gateway tool to other digital transformation capabilities. We are seeing it moving more freely up and down the organisation. I, I don't think it was happening as much um, a few months ago. What does that mean? I think there's also one other big benefit when we're talking about executives getting more involved in the conversation and recognising that RPA isn't necessarily just a tactical capability, it's actually a strategic enabler. And when we start people seeing people think that way, what we're also seeing is the executives are also helping to bring different parts of the business together. Because one of the things we realise is that when you see it as a strategic enabler, you really do need to bring everybody together, the business, IT, some of the other enabling areas. And I suppose one of the things I love best about RPA is that it does help create those bridges within the organisation, which sometimes culturally can be difficult to cross. And, and when people start realising that they're working together to jointly create value, that's when you start to see really um, big movements and also real competitive advantage. Because it's not just about the technology, it's about what you build around the technology in terms of culture and capability and organisational um, change that really drives the full uh, benefit for the organisation. But if I just pick on some of the examples that we're seeing as increasing priorities and in that we're working really closely with clients on, uh, billing is becoming a, a, a real, you know, having frictionless billing where it's done much more quickly, much more accurately, uh, the correction of billing in certain amongst certain clients has become a really big issue. Um, updating core billing systems, getting customers to self-serve is another really oh, big area. So manual and time-consuming, that kind of stuff. And the oh, absolutely. And, and yeah. the amount of effort that's drawn into the organisation to, to, to correct these processes is quite huge. Importantly, though, they're also quite repetitive. Quite repetitive, yeah. um, quite mundane. So there's lots of ways of fixing those kind of problems. Um, also, differentiating differentiated customer service. So everyone's focusing more heavily on that. Again, better use of digital channels. Um, looking at new payment options, new custom, you know, product channels that are more digital than what they were previously. Um, more consistent and more personalised customer communications as well. And also making things like customer onboarding, tariff changes, account updates, all of that stuff is stuff that really fits neatly into the RPA space and is actually not that hard to do when you start looking at those end-to-end -end, um, solutions. Uh, one of the new areas as well that we're seeing is a really important part of it, um, our clients needs in focusing on competitive advantage is how quickly they adapt to regulatory change. So yeah. some, of our, some of our industry vertical areas, like if I take banking, if I take utilities as examples, they're being smashed by new regulatory change. Again, competitive advantage comes in there when you can be much more responsive to those requirements, um, you can reduce your compliance risk, all that, all that space. Um, and probably one other area which I think works for a number of different clients, um, critical asset management. It's a really painful area to manage, a lot of, a lot, and actually accelerating the ability to optimise things like inventory control and order management is really essential. Again, these are key areas that we're involved in. And I found it interesting in the poll results we saw a minute ago that, you know, we had nearly half of the respondents felt that the roadblocks were that automated the wrong processes, followed right behind that by poor ROI. And I guess both of those speak to that 
engagement level early on with folks who know what they're doing, right? Because I think what we've seen a lot of on the market is um, people having that proof of value or proof of concept, but going around and having a bit of a tinker and saying, can I, can I, can I do this perhaps without the appropriate guidance? And, I, and I, you know, when I hear a client talk about that, I sort of say, well, would you actually, if you're going to set up a whole new division of your organisation, is that what you do? Would you go and have a wee tinker first? Would you hire two or three people and say, let's see how this goes? Why don't you call centre? Do I go, I'll hire two or three people and see how that goes? I'm like, yeah, not really. We really build that whole plan and, and and go for it. And I guess some of that comes down to how we get, um, you know, what we believe, Blue Prism believe, and I know you do also, to be one of the key things, is how do we get executive sponsorship to make this actually transformational rather than just a few tasks getting automated. And so, again, I'd like to ask our listeners, and I'm sorry to keep going back to you folks, but we're very interested to see what's happening. But how, how much, you know, how do you see it's resonating with your C-suite? I mean, tell us how your, the C-suite in your organisation, how, how much is RPA resonating with them? And I guess uh, while our, uh, our listeners are doing that, John, I mean, perhaps you could talk us a little bit about productivity gains you know, have you got any standout productivity gains you've seen from some of your clients? You know, somebody who's made an extreme, you know, had some extreme value in that respect. Yeah, look, I mean, not surprisingly, we see some of the best productivity gains in the back office. That's a, that's a sort of like what we would describe as the, the best place to start in, in some of what we're seeing now. Some of the new dimensions of productivity gain is around reshoring activity as well to you know, as a, as, a, as a sidebar, it's also about organisational resilience. I think what I'm seeing at the moment too, look, a lot of companies in the last few months have gone through some pretty tough times and they've also already done a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of productivity changes in terms of reducing uh, headcount and various other things as well. So a lot of what we're talking about at the moment is not so much productivity gain, but it's about capacity creation. So yeah. I've got to reduce workforce. I don't have as many people as I did before. So from their perspective, what it's really about is actually creating more capacity with the workforce that they have. I mean, to be really frank, in the, in the, back, in the back office, we do see when it's done well, you should be getting gains of around 60%, sometimes more. I've seen higher in some instances. Uh, that really requires quite a deliberate focus and a really strong um, platform and, you know, so hold a business approach. To, to really get those outcomes. I mean, to, to pick up on your point earlier, when we see people starting with POCs and POVs, they usually start with what they call a painful process or a bad process. I generally like to say to people, can we just talk about some of your really good processes, the ones that are really yeah. stable, that are driving a lot of value for your company, because there's a very good chance they're your best automation opportunity. It's yeah. not, the, not the ones that you complain about every day. Let's not, let's not automate a bad process badly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, interesting to see the responses on the screen here. We've got 10, nearly 10% 10 of our listeners have got C-suites not really resonating at all. Um, and, mm. you know, another 10% saying that executives on board and underway and the remaining 80% say some degree of interest in RPA is a key part of our digital transformation. I think interesting, I mean, recently Blue Prism sponsored a worldwide study of uh, decision makers and and you know, white collar workers, key executives, uh, including in Australia across about four or 500 folks. One of the really interesting things that came out of that is that we see that 80% of decision makers believe it's important for driving digital transformation. And we kind of see that here. Um, and 70% of the same decision makers see RPA as a solution to global productivity. Now, this is a white paper that all um, attendees and participants will get as part of the um, post event. Uh, uh, mail out along with the link, but it's really interesting for those of you, those of you in that eight percent where it's not resonating, take this white paper and, and give it to your executives and say, if you want to keep up with the uh, with, keep up with the um, the crowd, you probably need to be considering a little more uh, detail. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, besides, you know, we talked about, you know, we saw a lot of BFSI clients in there, and I guess you alluded to earlier that you, you haven't really seen a vertical where there's any problem. With finding some RPA opportunities. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? About how, you know, some folks have this perception that I, you know, I can't, you know, I haven't got any process to automate, you know, how can I possibly get any value out of this? Um, what, what's your view there, John? Oh, look, it's, it's a simple one. As I said, we've already, we already worked across 25 different industries. Uh, mm. So I haven't yet found, I mean, every industry that I'm aware of has, has some form of 
back office activity, whether it's HR, like that, right? finance, I mean, if, if they haven't got that, I'd be stunned. <laughs> so from that perspective, I think there's plenty of opportunities. I mean, to be to be frank though, again, uh, to me, the, the the back office is your is often your starting point. It's a great proof place. But where you're going to get real value and what we see with a lot of our clients, when they start getting real value out of their program is when they start moving into their operations. They start looking at those, you know, those mission critical, business critical processes that have to work all the time, where accuracy is important, where scale is important. And when you start looking at them through an automation lens, that's when you start to really reap the benefit. And again, I wouldn't say there's any, any industry that's immune to that either. Look, so we're nearly at time. where she are at times. We're running a little bit late, but look, we've got a final poll um, to put to our, our listeners. Uh, you know, has the current pandemic made any change to your digital transformation plans? Uh, and very simple, yes or no. Uh, and, and you know, John, briefly while our, just you know while our listeners um, complete the poll, just in a briefly, I mean, have you seen this? You know, what you see the this the next, the future of work, if you like, and you know, is it accelerating? Yeah. And we talked about it a little earlier. Well, well, I mean, I, I think I think we we actually have to stop talking about the future of work because I actually think we are in the future of work already. Yeah, um, pretty much. People, are. Yeah, we are. What people described uh, as the future of work, even as I said six months ago, is actually happening right now. It's more tangible. Um, through COVID than it ever has been before. You know, the investment that people are making, the companies' investments that are being made now around things like, you know, working virtually and remotely, uh, using digital channels to encourage self-service. Um, you know, there's a lot more conversation about contactless transactions, uh, the consolidation activities and the reshoring oper operation activities. All of those initiatives point directly to RPA and integrated intelligence automation uh -huh. ecosystem. It's all about how do you bring that together in a really sensible way. Um, I suppose the only, the only other thing that I'll add is, and I know we're running out, we're running out of time, but really quickly, um, there's also a, there's another dialogue that's starting up quite a lot at the moment, which is about the citizen developer and what's the role yep. of the citizen developer in this space. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of that, especially as people become more digitally competent through this kind of space. I think we're going to see that really pick up pace over the next few months. Interesting, yeah. Well, we've reached the end of uh, our session today. Uh, have we got any questions come through? No. If you have any questions, now is the time to type them. Um, we'll give that a couple of minutes. So John, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, working from our various homes, as everybody on the other end, I'm sure, except for some in geographies. I think we had a couple of New Zealanders dialing in, so they're enjoying a free and untrammeled access to uh, all the good things in life. Um, I'm envious. Yeah, yeah, and for those of you in the US, our commiserations. I know we had a couple of registrations from the US, and if they are dialing in, it's at a ridiculous time for them. But no questions, Mark. I haven't seen any pop up on the uh, on the chat room. So if there are no questions, uh, look, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time today. This recording will be available. Um, there will be a follow-up email in which we'll attach the white paper and. Uh, also contact details for the folks at Reveal Group should you wish to know more about them or any of their products. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Really Thank appreciate you. it. See you later.